students taking part in the yearly Idaflieg summer camp in Germany have been waiting for this day a long time. They need calm air and a stable atmosphere to conduct the planned performance tests with a duo discus glider. Such conditions are found just after dawn early in the morning. In Germany it is in the early 30s that so-called academic flying groups, Arkafliegen in short, have been carrying out comparative experiments. At the airfield Arlen Elschingen the students will again be supported and advised by engineers of the German Aerospace Research Institute, the DLR. The DLR has provided the calibration plane DG300, whose flight and glide characteristics are regularly measured down to the most minute detail. The gliding performance of the Dieu discus can be found out by applying the comparative flight maneuvers with planes flying in formation. The summer camp gives students the opportunity of both actually piloting the gliders as well as of getting to know the method of comparative flight measurement. Today it is Janis Neumann of the Ackerflieg of Karlsruhe who will pilot the DG300. The Dieu discus will be flown by Thomas Sandmann of the Ackerflieg of Brunswick University. Shortly after sunrise, both gliders are towed into the air and start their long ascent into the sky. The air traffic control at Munich has especially established a corridor for the experiments. While both sailplanes are towed up to a height of 4000 meters, we will use the time for a brief theoretic introduction into the comparative flight procedure. At a certain constant speed, a glider may cover 400 meters of distance from an altitude of 10 meters. Hence the relation of thinking to gliding is 1 to 40, or to simplify it further, we say that the glider has a glide ratio of 40. At higher speed, the range of the plane is reduced, the glide ratio is lower. At each flight we now take a picture of the plane's position at the same point in time. This gives us a series of measurement points, the so-called speed polar. This procedure of surveying a plane's characteristics has been called the calibrate method. Exact results can only be obtained after many flights in calm air. In such flights the data is collected and evaluated by the expensive electronic equipment installed in the DG300. Dietmar Schmerwitz of the DLR explains the most important parts. Hinter dem Cockpit haben wir eine Box in diesem Flugzeug. Here in the box installed behind the cockpit there is the sensor unit. There is the altitude sensor. Für die Höhenmessung. An acceleration sensor in longitudinal direction for measuring the axis attitude, for example, as well as two pitot sensors for measuring speed. An important detail is this Prandtl pitot probe, which allows for an exact measurement of speed. A specially designed speed indicator has also been installed. The planes have now reached half their target altitude and keep going up in big circles in their reserved airspace. As the flying performance is registered by the inbuilt electronic equipment of the DG300, it is sufficient to establish the performance of other planes in relation to the DG300 itself. For that purpose, both planes are flying in formation are photographed and continue flying next to each other at constant speed in the same air mass. After about three minutes, their difference in altitude is recorded by taking a photograph.
The tow rope will be released now any moment. We are at almost 4000 meters above sea level. The gliders have now released and move into position for the first point of measurement. In the motorized plane, the pilots Getschtich and Dietmar Schmerwitz prepare for taking the first picture. Speed, air temperature, altitude and time of measurement will be written into the prepared protocol. The countdown for the first point of measurement will start as soon as the gliders have reached the agreed speed. From now on, the gliders will fly in close formation at constant speed. After about three minutes, the motorized plane gets into position for the final picture of this measurement point. The gliders now form up for a measurement point at higher speed. As the flight performance of the double-seater is superior to that of the calibration plane, the due discus starts from slightly below. This is done to make sure that the planes are not too far apart at the final picture. On average, 10 measurement points are necessary to establish the polars. For planes without Fowler flaps, two flights are sufficient. Three to four flights are needed for planes with Fowler flaps. A few months later, we go and visit the DLR at Brunswick. At the Institute for Aeromechanics, Gerstich is evaluating the photograph of the comparative flights. The Boscart viewing device blows up the slides and allows a precise determination of the coordinates. At first, the tip of the fuselage of the calibration plane is defined at the initial point and its position is recorded. By establishing the coordinates of the tail unit, the length of the fuselage becomes the reference when judging the distance of the two planes. The data transfer from the initial photo is finished by recording the measurement of the dew discus. But it's only with the coordinates of the final photograph that the evaluation of the first measurement point can begin. All the data has now been compiled. The coordinates of all the flying positions the comparative protocol taken down during the flight and also the center of gravity of the geodiscus as it relates to its takeoff weight. Hans Karl Schmidt of the DLR is now loading all the data and all of the coordinates into a special evaluation program. It only takes a short time until the speed polar of the geodiscus appear on the screen. In comparison one easily recognizes that at higher speed the flight performance of the geodiscus is better than that of the calibration plane. Today high gliding ratios can be combined with good and safe flight characteristics. In the early years of gliding the problems were of quite another sort. Finally, short hops turned into some form of flight. But considerable time should go by until anything looking like today's gliding was developed. Hans Zacher, an engineer and one of the founders of systematic flight measurements, recalls. 
In the early 30s, gliders were only built for performance, that is, to stay a long time in the air with a good glide ratio. Good flight characteristics, such as a good handling or stability against pitch down, were not that important. In the late 30s, the D30 from Darmstadt, piloted by Hans Zacher, was already a milestone in the design of gliders. The D30 here demonstrates its superior glide performance against the respectable Horton 4. After the war, the Horton brothers continued the development of their only wing gliders in Argentina. Apart from the gliding performance, they especially intended to improve the flight characteristics. Here a Horton 15A serves in an experiment with woolen threads showing the stalled airflow in very slow flight. In Germany it is Hans Zacher who from the 50s onwards has kept driving ahead the further development of the systematic examination of flight characteristics. The control force measurement and a few other methods have in the meantime become part of a standard procedure that has been named the Zacher Protocol. In the yearly Ida Fleet camps, as here in Brunswick in 61, the students of the Acha Fleets used the opportunity to compare their new designs under expert supervision. By now it is clear that apart from good flight performance, Excellent flight characteristics and a good cockpit design are of high importance. By consequently translating their theoretical findings into practice, the work of the Ida Fleet, in which all the Aka Fleets are organized, has been an important factor in the development of gliders. To list some of the constructions of the respective academic flying groups. There is the D36 from Darmstadt, the powered glider AK1 from Karlsruhe, the Brunswick SB10, the standard glider D38, the telescope wing glider FS29 from Stuttgart, the SB11 with special flaps, the two-seater FS31, the aerobatic glider Mu28 from Munich, the only wing SB13, the Berlin B13 with two seats located side by side, the AFH24 from Hanover with a slidable front part, and the two-seater D41 from Darmstadt. This high-performance plane with a wingspan of 20 meters is designed for the new class of two-seaters and had its maiden flight in the summer of 93. We will demonstrate the main points of the Zara protocol with regard to this D41. Dietmar Müller of the Arka Fleet Darmstadt starts by evaluating the cockpit, judging the view from the pilot seat, the pilot seat itself, the levers as well as the instrumentation. And, of course, how to use the emergency lever for casting off the cockpit hood. The most simple devices are used for the flight measurements. A measuring tape attached to the control stick allows the pilot to read off the movements of the stick while in flight. This instrument, for measuring different angles, will give the pilot a good idea about his actual position in the air relating to all three axes. The first assessment of flight conditions relates to the take-off behavior. At this point, the pilot concentrates on whether the plane shows any tendency towards running off the runway or taking its nose up. If there is much thermal activity, the plane is towed up above the clouds, where the air is calmer, to examine the flight stability.
After trimming the plane, pilots start testing the static longitudinal stability. At the speed of trim, the measuring tape shows the control stick's position to be at 46 cm. The pilot then reduces his speed and measures how much force is now needed. This figure and movement of the stick are written into the protocol. In this way we also assess the glider's static longitudinal stability at higher speed. It becomes somewhat more lively once we determine the dynamic longitudinal stability. The plane is flying a little slower than the indicated speed of trim. The moment steady flight is reached by slightly pulling the control stick, the pilot releases the stick. The plane regains speed and starts swinging up and down. In the protocol we take note of the duration of these oscillations at minimum and maximum speed. The plane's maneuverability in rolls is established by flying quickly alternating turns. The pilot changes from a 45 degree left turn straight into a 45 degree right turn with rudders at maximum throw. The rate of roll is also written into the protocol. The most important test for the Zacher protocol is the overall performance during slow flight or in pitching down. After flying slowly, the plane gets into a stall, then begins shaking and the airflow is breaking off. The pilot notes stall speed, pull-out speed and pitch-down characteristics of the plane. So's last tests conclude the most important points of the Zacher protocol. Once again it will get exciting because a tailspin test necessary to get the official certificate must be done. Planning the first spin maneuver, test pilot Gerstich makes sure of the center of gravity. A special retarding parachute at the rear fuselage is to stabilize the plane in an emergency. While the adrenaline level of the Akaflik pilots is rising, test pilot Gerstich is making his final preparations in a quiet and concentrated manner. We will have three rotations, alternately to the left and to the right, with ailerons neutral, with and counter to the turn of spin. Testing is successfully brought to an end if the pilot can reliably stop the rotation within given positions of the center of gravity. Every test is recorded by the ground crew. Three. 
The D-41 got through the first test brilliantly. Next day we can talk cameraman Holger Eichhorn into filming further spinning tests from out of the cockpit. Initial altitude 1,900 meters, spinning straight rotations to the left, aileron with the same sense of rotation. We are slowing down. And here we go. One, nose up. Two. Three. Turning further one quarter. Speed 150 kilometers. Altitude 1390 meters. In 1970, these pictures arose special interest in the gliding community. Helmut Treiber from the Ackerflieg Brunswick had been examining the flapping of the wings at varying speeds. Through periodic movement of the ailerons, he brought the wing into constant vibrations. On these SP9s, those problems were solved by modifying the ailerons and stiffening the control rods. Guido Brendes, engineer at the Institute for Airplane and Lightweight Construction at Brunswick, conducting further research into wing flapping. Their computer-based system is supported by two vibration generators symmetrically fixed on the wings that allow systematic flapping tests. This procedure reduces the risk of wrong or distorted subjective judgments by the pilots and it also reduces the risk of test flying. Reducing the drag of the fuselage by narrowing the body created new problems. In certain conditions the rudder fin may vibrate heavily. At the Ackerflieg in Karlsruhe, the students develop a computer-based series of experiments in which they provoke vibrations in the tail in order to establish the strain on the body. The design of this unit allows fine variations of the frequency until the tail responds with its own vibrations. The results from these experiments are to help optimizing the structure of the fuselage. Rainer Arelt of the Jakovlik Stuttgart is experimenting with woolen threads to make visible the stalled airflow at the part of the body where wing and fuselage are joined. 
These connections are critical at planes with wing flaps or Fowler flaps. At the Stuttgart FS-32, a concave profile was attached to the left side for experimental purposes. In slow flight you can easily see that the stalled airflow is developing later on the left hand side. For some time, Ida Fleek has tried to find out corresponding flight characteristics for aerobatic planes. Special importance is given to determining roll rates at varying speed, the reaction of gliders at stalled airflow and in spin, and different evaluation of the flight characteristics while flying upside down. The future will show whether such tests on aerobatic planes will find their place in the EDA fleet. As in the tradition of the EDA Fleek, this summer camp has again introduced some students to the practical testing of gliders. By applying new technologies and contributing outstanding designs, the EDA Fleek, with its respective Acker Fleeks, has influenced and promoted in the most important way the development of sailplane gliding.